Suppose that your grandfather died several months ago, and when they read his will, you discovered that he'd left you $250,000. What would you do if $250,000 suddenly and unexpectedly fell into your lap? Well, one thing you might do is buy that shiny silver Lamborghini that you've been dreaming about since you're 25, and if you did that, you might even have enough left over to make the first insurance payment. Another thing you might do is pay off your daughter's medical school debt. Well, most of it anyway. And yet another thing you might do would be to buy a ticket for a ride to suborbital space. I'm going to try to make the case for you today as to why you should choose that third option. Now, Spaceport America is located in the southern part of New Mexico, and it's a leading center for suborbital space activity. It was developed by and is owned and operated by the state of New Mexico, so that makes every one of you here today a part owner of that facility. So let's talk a little bit about that space experience. So there are three compelling elements of a suborbital space experience. The first one is an opportunity to experience sustained microgravity. Microgravity is also sometimes called uh, zero gravity or weightlessness. And if you've seen videos of astronauts floating around the space station or sometimes researchers in the Vomit Comet aircraft doing somersaults, that's, uh, they're experiencing microgravity. So it's, it's a more intense and a longer lasting version of the experience you feel if you're in a very fast elevator as it begins to descend or sometimes even if you're in a car that goes over a rise in the road and then suddenly goes into a dip. The second compelling element is the ability, the opportunity to see things that can only be seen from space. The blackness of the sky, the curvature of the earth, the thin blue band of the atmosphere. And finally, the third compelling element is the opportunity to see the magnificence and the enormity of the earth and to think about that. And many of the people who've had that experience have actually described that experience as life-changing. So, uh, to get to space, to, to be a true space experience, you need to reach the altitude of the Kármán line. The Kármán line is 100 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, or about 62 miles. So why is space defined to begin at 62 miles? The reason for that could be the subject of a talk of itself, but the short answer is that as airplanes fly higher and higher in the atmosphere, the air becomes thinner and thinner, and eventually they have to go so fast that uh, that they're going at orbital speed, which is 17,500 miles per hour. And that happens at about 100 kilometers, hence that's the threshold of space. So if space is only 62 miles that way, how do we get there? Well, one way, potentially, would be to, to travel at, say, 10 miles per hour. Unlike orbit, where you must reach a speed of 17,500 miles per hour, there is no specific speed requirement to get to suborbital space, so you only need to, to go up. So you can go at 10 miles per hour, it's going to take you about six, minutes to, or six hours to get there, but you'd be burning lots and lots of fuel, and that just isn't practical. So the way we normally do it is we burn a really powerful rocket motor for 10 to 60 seconds and accelerate very quickly to several times the speed of sound, say 3,500 miles per hour, and then coast the rest of the way. All right? So uh, on, on the way up, very interesting things happen. You will, once you're outside uh, the Earth's atmosphere and your rocket motor is burned out and you're not feeling any drag from the atmosphere, you will be experiencing the condition that physicists refer to as free fall, and that's what causes microgravity. And during that time, you'll be able to do all those things that you've seen those videos of astronauts doing on the space station. You'll be able to float around your cabin. You'll be able to do those really interesting experiments where you lay out a, a line of M&Ms, say, and you lunge out and eat them one by one. All those things will be possible, but there's one big difference. Those astronauts on the space station have days, weeks, even months to do that. You're only going to have a few minutes. So, uh, so you're going to need to... Uh, to take advantage of that time. Now on the good side, since you're only going to be there for a few minutes, you're not going to need to, to wash your hair. Okay, so while you're floating around your cabin, I would hope that you would take a few minutes to look out the window and see those wonderful sights, that black sky, the curved earth, 
and all those things. And that you would take a little bit of time and contemplate your position on the earth and the earth's position, even though it's enormous, in the much larger solar system. In the solar system's position in the enormously larger galaxy and our galaxy's position is one of billions out there in the universe at large. Again, many people have described that experience as life-changing. In the history of humans in space, there have been only about 600 people that have been there. We think that space tourism has the potential to increase the number of people that have the space experience by orders of magnitude. So why would that be? Well, one reason is that the space vehicles that are being developed for, for space tourism are reusable. Right now, as you probably know, we throw away the hardware after every launch of people to space. So making it reusable is going to help a lot. Another reason is that these vehicles are only going to go to speeds of, say, 3,500 miles per hour, and they're only going to go to altitudes of perhaps 60 miles or 70 miles, so the design is simplified quite a bit. And another reason is because these, these missions are only going to last for a few minutes, and so consequently you don't have to take along large supplies of life support, oxygen, water, food. From the passenger's perspective, not only that, but, but the rigors of being accelerated only 3,500 miles per hour mean that a lot more people are going to be able to do this. And secondly, uh, because you'll be able to train for the mission in a, just a short time, maybe a few days or a week, and do your mission, you won't, you'll be able to do this in sort of a vacation-like setting. Um, so the, the Dennis Tito, who is, is widely regarded as the world's first space tourist, he spent many months training with the Russians to fly to the space station, and he also spent two million, uh, $20 million of his own money to do that. Okay, so uh, if, if space is life-changing, we'd like to get more people there. But space has a problem right now. There's what I call the space conundrum. Space launches are very expensive because the, because the annual number is very low, but at the same time, the annual number is very low because they're so expensive. So how can we break that paradigm? Well, perhaps we can take an example from the computer industry. Do you, some of you are old enough to remember when computers were very expensive because very few were sold, and at the same time, very few computers were sold because they were so expensive. So the computer industry needed a killer app to break that paradigm. And it turns out that, in my view at least, computer gaming was a significant factor in breaking that paradigm. There were a few individuals who found computer gaming so compelling that they were willing to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to buy a computer so that they could do that. So if you think about it, look around your house and how many computers do you see and how expensive were they? You can be thankful that in the 1980s there were people who were willing to spend many thousands and thousands of dollars for the for the ability to play Dungeons and Dragons and Tetris. Some of you remember those, I'm sure. Okay, so, so this life-changing experience that you've had, that you're going to have on your space ride, will provide, be a source of tremendous personal fulfillment and personal enjoyment. But at the same time, that space mission is going to, you're, by doing that, you're going to be helping to ensure our future as a species in space by helping to bring down the costs and make space much more accessible. Okay, so uh, you will be helping, for example, to make humans a multi-planet species. You'll be helping to make it possible in the future for, for generations of people to come to generate much or most of their electrical power requirements by putting solar collectors in orbit around the Earth. You'll be making it possible for us to derive much or most of our metals requirements by mining asteroids rather than mining the Earth. You'll be making it possible to make better materials in space for example, better crystalline materials that will lead to even better computers than we have today. Perhaps better, purer pharmaceuticals. Grandpa would be proud. <laughs>